it's been a rough couple of years. We learned a lot about ourselves. We learned that we like to get outside. We like to walk around our neighborhoods. We like to explore our parks. We don't like to stay inside. So what I'm going to tell you about is a project that we embarked on with the City of Toronto called Artworks TO, which is designed to help people get outside. Now, the City of Toronto folks had time on their hands too, as we did. And what they did with their time is they mapped every single work of public art in the city. Over 1,500 works of public art across the city of Toronto, ranging from small, tiny pieces to large sculptures that folks might pass every day. This is part of something called the Year of Public Art. And it's designed to increase the profile of public art, to raise it up, and to help people understand what it is that they're looking at when they pass it by. And so what I want to do is tell you about that, because for many people, public art is strange. It's mysterious, and honestly, it looks weird. Frankly, what is this? <laughs> Actually, it's one of my favorite pieces. It's by a Polish uh, couple. Um, they go by the name of Blue Republic. The name of the piece is Stargate. Uh, this couple of artists emigrated to Canada from Poland. And in so doing, they tried to evoke this feeling of weirdness and alienation that you feel when you move into a neighborhood. And I think, honestly, they've captured it perfectly with this particular piece here. So, let's take a walk. If you were sitting in Christie Pitts Park in Toronto, you would open up something called the Driftscape app. And on the Driftscape app, you would find that you're sitting beside a large letter A, which is the icon for the Driftscape tours. The large letter A here in the park beside you as you're eating your sandwich is actually pointing you to a boulder. Now, honestly, and maybe I'm different, I don't really pay boulders a great deal of attention. I walk past them all the time in the city, as you might do. It's an interesting boulder in its own right. It has some undulations and some cracks and some crevices and so on. But that's not what makes this boulder interesting. This is actually a world-famous boulder. What makes it interesting is the story. In 2004, Maura Doyle put this boulder into the Toronto Sculpture Garden. The boulder came with its own guidebook, a guide to Toronto boulders, 2004. And it came with a map of, 2000, of 20 other boulders in the city of Toronto. These are erratic boulders. They're billion-year-old boulders that have been moved by the actions of glaciers and displaced from one place to another. Maura Doyle found this in Peterborough, and she moved it from Peterborough and placed it in the Toronto Sculpture Garden specifically for this exhibition. The exhibition was called, There's a New Boulder in Town. So having been made to move 10,000 years ago by the actions of a glacier, it was made to move again in 2004 by the actions of an artist. Maura Doyle made a sculpture out of a rock. And she changed forever how we look at the sculptural landscape of a city. So using this as a starting point, we built 50 art-themed tours of the city so that you can walk through the city and understand better what you're looking at, things that you might walk past each day and not pay any attention to. Now, years later, this boulder is going to be climbed on, it'll be chalked, and in fact, today, if you went there, there's a nice happy face on the other side. Kids obviously run around it, they play king of the castle, and years from now, some intergalactic archaeologist will look at this boulder and say, what made this boulder so special? An artist. So let's start this tour. We start from this point, and we will continue, and our next stop might be this eagle. This is a mural painted under a railway bridge on both sides. The mural is painted by transient indigenous men. Through a project at a place called Namerez, led by a woman called Paula Gonzalez, this project is intended to help indigenous men connect with their indigenous heritage as a process of healing. On either side of this railway bridge, which is painted in bands of color, you'll see silhouettes of Things that are important to First Nations, an eagle, a buffalo, a bear, 
wolves, medicinal plants. There are similar murals around the city as part of this project. So much indigenous art, so much indigenous history is invisible in the city. We mostly see a built environment that's been put up in the last 200 years or so as we walk through the city. And so we partnered with we, we partnered with First Story Toronto to map indigenous places across the city as part of a process of mapping indigenous heritage in places that you can't see. So you can walk along busy Danf on Davenport Avenue and you can discover that Davenport Avenue is in fact the site of an ancient First Nation portage that joins the Humber and the Don Rivers across an ancient glacial shoreline of Lake Iroquois. You can find a place in Toronto that is the site where artist Norval Morisot held his first ever show in 1962 that sold out in 24 hours. That's incredibly important to First Nation people. Artist, Haida artist Dan Drever showed just how important an eagle is with his giant eagle 5.1 coming out of the side of an office building in downtown Toronto. So in the tour, you can hear Dan talk about his creative process, about the inspiration for this eagle, how it was inspired by a piece of pottery found on the site, how from his perspective, eagles are a symbol of movement and travel, how they connect us to the animal spirit. He's talking to us in his words. In this way, we created an audio tour, essentially using the city as an art gallery. So on the, on the app, you would see icons like this marking the first story stories across Toronto, where you could uh, sit in a park or wander down the street and find places within the city that tell these invisible stories. Our next stop might be this traffic signal box at the corner of DuPont and Symington. Now, traffic signal boxes are essentially anonymous. They're usually painted gray, and they're very often tagged with graffiti. They can be somewhat unsightly, and honestly, we don't notice them a great deal. Toronto's street art program uses these as canvases. And so what that does is it covers up the graffiti, but it provides a platform for artists to express themselves. And maybe through that program, they are encouraged to pursue a career in graphic design or commercial art. Now, this particular one caught my eye because it's colorful, yes, and you might say, well, it's, it's nice. This particular one, though, is a scene from Nunavut. Orange-covered lichen covering a rock, a white ice floe, green seaweed at the bottom. In fact, this is a scene from Nunavut in Baffin Island. It's by an artist called Ulusi Sela. Ulusi Sela is from Cape Dorset's famous printmaking studio in Baffin Island. She started drawing when she was 14. She sold her first piece of art at the age of 15. You can see her art in New York City at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and beside you here in the city of Toronto as you're waiting for the light to change holding your cup of coffee. That's how powerful this tool can be in your hands as you're encountering this art as you're moving through the city. We mapped over 500 works of art across the city from large works of sculpture like the Henry Moore that you saw at the beginning to these small traffic signal boxes like the one I just described down to a tiny carving of a squirrel sitting on a ledge in a hospital that has a, hit, that, that has a story behind its creation. Each one of these has meaning. Each one of these has a story of its creation that very often we don't experience because we don't have the information beside us. We mapped large murals, and this is one of them. We worked with more than 30 community partners across the city and artists to discover the stories and discover the meaning behind the works. This is one at 10 Boltby Avenue. 10 Boltby Avenue is a Toronto-assisted housing complex. Um, it's populated by African and Asians for the most part, people that can be marginalized or in some cases invisible. It was important to this group that they be seen and heard. And so the murals, and there's seven of them, about 100 feet long, the murals grew out of a process of community consultation. And it was 
it was a, 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 pro a project that was led by women of color. So the group is called Equality for Women of Color, the Ewok Project. It was important to these women that they create powerful and meaningful representations of racialized women. This one um, in particular, To Be Seen is to Belong is the name of the project. And in this, you can hear them talk about the project. You can read text that they wrote. You can hear them talk in their words. You can see the images that they chose, and you can see a wonderful video about the creation of this piece. They are talking to you in, in their words. To tell these stories, we went underground as well. Now, at Place des Arts, you can see a wonderful stained glass that is done by Frederick Bach in 1967. Uh, it talks about the history of music in the city of Montreal. It was one of the first pieces of art in the Montreal metro system. Toronto has also done this similar thing. In Union Station, there is a magnificent um, stained glass as well that has just been installed in the last few years. Toronto's College Street subway station is where this is from. The great Charles Pactor, who's Queen Elizabeth riding a moose, is something of a cultural icon in the city, was commissioned to create enamel panels on either side of, of the subway. At the time, Harold Ballard owned the Toronto Maple Leafs. Harold Ballard didn't want any representation of the Toronto Maple Leafs insignia on any of the players that were chosen here. And so, poor Charles had to rub out all of the Toronto Maple Leafs insignia from these players that he had placed on these enamel panels. The Habs, of course, had no such issues, and so, Every hockey game, Toronto fans have had to walk past the Montreal Canadiens on one side, playing some other random blue guys on the other side who happen to be on the southbound tracks as well. I'm a Habs fan. We created games too. We know that people like agency. They want to have ownership of the process. We also want to make searching for art more fun. And so we created quests where people aren't given the specific instructions of cross this, turn left, go down that street, and go under the railway bridge. We'd give them clues and riddles. So, for example, we would say, look for a game played by giants, pointing them in the direction of Susan Schell's giant basalt dominoes at the corner of Bloor and Spadina. Look for something that might be useful on a fishing trip, pointing them towards Douglas Copeland's giant fishing bobs down by the waterfront. In this way, we make looking for art more fun. And maybe children are a little more encouraged to look at these pieces and follow along instead of, I don't want to go to the museum, you know? And so we've created quests that allow people to discover art in the way that art, in some ways, should be discovered, in some sense, as a surprise to you. This one is uh, one of those. It's called Chicken Run. And we take people from point to point to find a chicken. But this is no ordinary chicken, of course. This is by a renowned artist, Stephen Cruz. It's a Sussex chicken, and it's uh, facing eastward toward the morning sun. A lot of settlers who came to Toronto came from Sussex County in England. And so this chicken is standing beside a Sussex Spaniel, another registered breed from Sussex County. And you can discover this on a street corner near Sussex Avenue, near the University of Toronto also one of our collaborators on the project. So quests like these and discoveries like these made this journey more interesting. And so standing, waiting for the streetcar in Toronto, you, um, you now are a little more enlightened about what this chicken is. We mapped heritage buildings like this one as well, the one we're in. And we also mapped poetry using data supplied by the, Toronto, by the Toronto Public Library, using their data to map invisible spots across the city where poetry is inspired or where poetry has been written. So, for example, you can sit in Gwendolyn McEwen Park in Toronto and you can discover that that's where she wrote, I'm just a page, but one day I'm going to be a book. I want to close with one last story here. So much, uh, there are so many graffiti artists in the city, ranging from taggers who deface walls to really talented graffiti artists and aerosol artists across the city that create murals. This is one, and we included it in the tour because of what it represents. It's a tribute by three of the artists, um, Flips, Creature, and Roll Solar, 
to the work of healthcare workers during the pandemic. You can see this obviously masked healthcare worker created with intricate style and beauty. It's called Art is Essential. As we tell these stories, we create meaning, we give, we make people's journey a little more interesting through the city. And so, like a flashlight, this tool can help us illuminate the art that we see and the path that we take. Thank you.